when the day comes that my measure is taken, I pray that there's sweet jazz music playing and that when I am asked the question, how tall did you stand? I can speak proudly the measure of myself and those who stood with me. How tall am I? How small am I? Compare me to the clock tower and I cower among brick dust and bread crusts, bird calls echoing like bell song, music from my tiny words. How small am I? How tall am I? Compare me to the time-worn path stones and I glow with them, shining in rain and moonlight or bright with sunlight and purpose. There is an orchestra behind the swell of my words. See, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort, safely in the hands of convenience, but rather when challenge and controversy keep him from seeing the length of his own stride. The man that can rise at that time is taller than height. He has become flight. If you cannot fly, then run. If you cannot run, then walk. If you cannot walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, remember, you are never small. Your music can rise from morning chimes to evening vesper lullabies.
next next one uh it's called sad little girl wife after she left me so <laughs> ready yeah. One, two, three. there's no more that's when she said it's over she's got me on my knees she knows what makes me bleed suffocating me suffocating me she's got me on my knees what makes me bleed suffocating me you're so sure we can't get back there no more she's got me on my Suffocating me, suffocating me. She's got me on my knees. She knows what makes me bleed. Suffocating me.
I'm here with Scott Kleinen and Ivan Flansha from Road Trip. Now, okay, how long have you guys been Road Trip? We started uh, about 2002. Uh, we actually met at our children's bus stop one time <laughs> and uh, uh, turned out, I said, do you play guitar? Yeah, I play guitar too. And uh, we got together and uh, probably within, we got some songs and uh, uh, polished them up. And uh, within about two weeks, we were out uh, playing. And uh, we've been doing it ever since, it's about 2002. Mm -hmm. So now when you perform, you guys, you guys do a mix of original stuff and covers. Correct. Yeah, we like to work some originals in. Uh, I try to shy away doing too many original songs simply for the fact that people have never heard them before. They like to uh, rock out with an, Right, what they, know. they want to be able to sing along and dance and everything, you know, so so uh, we tend to stick to covers. And uh, um, but we have a very wide variety of music that everything from, uh, we do some folk, some country, to rock, a little bit of punk, you know what I mean? Wow. A little bit of everything. So now the stuff you play today, that's all original. You guys wrote it. Yes, that's now, all original. Okay. So you're the lyricist. Yes. And then Ivan, you rock out on the do additional what I can. music. Yeah. You do. <laughs> I fill in. Around you work him, on it. So. I mean, those the strings were amazing. Like, how long have you guys actually been playing? Like, when did you start learning how to do this? Mm. I was a late bloomer. I didn't uh, actually get serious about the guitar until uh, till I was probably about 21, 22. I mean, I'd strummed around on a little bit, but. Uh, uh, as I said, I met with my friend Bobby, and uh, you know, he you know, said, "Hey, you need to do that. That's a D chord. You do that. That's a G." And you know, I can't read music, but uh, um, uh, so you write it without actually even being able to write it down. Well, I just have, have it all up here. Yeah, I just know how how, it want, how I want it to come out. And he has a good natural instinct. He really does. For so music. all you guys, when you play, you just keep everything up in your head. Pretty much. Well, if there's mm -hmm. some that I like and uh, we want to keep it, I mean, I'll write it down, um, and I have a. I have a book that's probably about this thick, all full of <laughs> songs that we've polished off and everything, and uh, I just like to keep that on hand that way, because there's some times where, you know, when you're playing out, uh, you keep doing the same song too many times, it starts to get stale, you know, so it's nice to go back and say, well, it's been 10 years since we played this one, let's do that, mm -hmm. you know? Well, so. I know you guys said that you have been playing like every other weekend since you guys have been together, sometimes even more. How some, do you... Sometimes we play... Uh, for a while, we were going roll. That's when we were younger too, huh? <laughs> uh, but we used yeah. to we used to play out almost uh, almost every Friday and Saturday night religiously. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the kids started getting older; they need more attention. And you know, you know, I can't uh, can't be out every single night doing that anymore. I got responsibilities. So, so how do you guys balance being like gods of the rock and roll bar circuit, and then you know having uh, jobs, family? Well, the family comes first. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely, this family's is just first. Fun. So it's still fun. Opinion. It's still yeah, fun it after fun. all these years. Oh, always. Yeah. When when it's not fun anymore, I won't be doing it. So you know, I'll yeah. hang in there. You know, there's I'll, no dreams. I'll be old, I'll be old and gray before I quit. Like that. <laughs> this is for. This is You're for not trying to head to L. A. No, as Nashville. Not 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 me anyway. No, uh, I don't. I think uh, you know that opportunity could have happened maybe you know when when I was 20 years younger. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I could have been marketable maybe you know. Um, but like I said, I mean, it, uh, just playing out now in the local circuit is, you know, is fine for me. And we have a good fan base, you know, because we've, we've played local for so long. There's, yeah. you know, a lot of people that come out and see us all the time. And, uh, but like I said, you know, my family's the most important thing. And uh, I got a good job. And uh, yeah. can I say the name of it? You can. Fox Pools. <laughs> Ooh, Fox Pools. Check them out. Check them out. <laughs> so now, for both of you guys, like, what makes you come up with these ideas? For the songs and and for the music, like I know you said you have one that was dedicated to your ex-wife. You have a song for your daughter. You know what makes you just decide you need to sit down and start writing? Um, lack of something to do. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of times, the times I'm just bored, <laughs> and uh, or you know, like, like um, I would have to say most frequently it happens. I'll be at work or uh, I'll be driving my truck or whatever, and and I'll just have this thing going on in my head and I'll get home, get my guitar out and, and I put words to it and just, you know, I got one verse and I got another verse and I got a chorus and, and I just keep adding to it. And right. I let I say, hi and watch come over and check this out. And I was like, hey, I like that. And so right. I, put, I put it in that big black book of I'd mine. I'd written quite a bit of music before Scott and I got together and it happened pretty much the same way. Uh, something would be in your head, you'd, you'd just start messing with it and something would come out. So. I don't know if that's a universal way people do it, but it's it works for us. 
Okay, so where, if people decide they are obsessed and want to become road trip groupies, where can they find you? We play mostly at, um, we're at the Valley Tavern in uh, Seven Valleys, Kicking Cadillacs in um, York Haven. Uh, we play at the Overbrook out in West York. Um, you have that, um, you have a website, um, Facebook? Um, I do have a, a, a Facebook website. Uh, I, I incorporate that with, uh, with Road Trip. Uh, it's, technology, right? It's with my other band. Uh, the Kodiak band. Now that band's a full four-piece band. We have Ivan's the lead guitar player with that band as well. We have a drummer and a bass player. Um, but I do have information about Road Trip on uh, the, the Kodiak Facebook site. So. Okay, so Facebook.com. Is it just Facebook.com? Kodiak. Uh, Kodiak band. Kodiak yeah. band. Kodiak band on Facebook. Awesome. Very and, cool. Uh, that that also lists all our uh, the dates the stuff that for we Road do Trip too, and everything. Yeah. Okay, so when is your next gig? What's your next show coming up? Cadillacs. Kicking Cadillacs at York Haven. I think that's uh, mm -hmm. next weekend. 15th? The 15th. Yes. So 15th. February 15th, you guys will be at Kicking Cadillacs up in York Haven. Mm -hmm. And then a awesome. Valentine's party. And then we're playing uh, uh, at uh, Carrie's Greens for a Valentine's Day party. And, uh, that's uh, Ooh, February 16th. Fancy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it's <laughs> really nice. Got some nice food in there, too. <laughs> okay, so admit it. Did you ever use the whole music thing to get chicks? Yes. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I think that's 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 how I I am. I actually, my current uh, wife Carrie, uh, I actually uh, met her on a website, which I'm not very uh, ashamed to admit. But uh, the wave of the future. But uh, she came out to. Uh, in fact, the very first date her and I ever had. Um, Ivan couldn't make it. He's a firefighter, and he got called into work. So I was stuck doing a, a solo show, and. Um, if this was at the Red Lion, the Red Lion Tavern, and uh, I'd forgotten my set list. And Carrie was new to the area, she's originally from Maryland, um, had no idea where we were. She got in my car and drove home and got lost uh, trying, to, mm. trying to find my house so she could run upstairs and grab this set list. And um, so she called, but that was her very first uh, road trip experience. And <laughs> she comes out to every single one of our shows now. I think she's our, our biggest fan. Number one. Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah, my wife's our number one fan, absolutely. Super cool. And you just use it to get all the women everywhere. Used to. It's been a long time. Right. Yes. Forms. Yeah. The good boy now. Yeah, right. he, used to, he used to have really long hair. And yeah, he used like to that. be all that. What? Thing. That was before the fire department. It was yeah. years ago. <laughs> So. so did the fire department come out and... Yes, yes. We have uh, you know, some of the guys sit in with us and play along, and um, a lot of the guys come out and hang yeah, out. Rocking firefighters. Yeah, 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 there's quite a number Nice. Of them. So, so now, are you, both of you guys actually from the York area? You grew up around here? I'm from California. It's in the San Francisco Bay Area. You ended I know. up here. How? I know, I know. 49ers just lost. It was depressing, but... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I lost I'm, money on that too, by the way. Go Ravens! Yeah. I'm a, well, I'm a, I grew up a Navy brat. Um, my father was in the Navy, and I, I've, I, I was actually born in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And then after that, I was whew, everywhere. I went from, uh, we were, I was in Maine, Alaska, um, Florida. Um, I was in Ireland. Uh, I was in Germany, wow. Luxembourg, Belgium, uh, Sweden, France, um, Spain. You know, been everywhere. <laughs> and after all that, you guys picked here. What made you decide to stay here and play here? Well, I came back only because uh, my father was, when he got stationed here in the Navy, and uh, it was, we came here, I was in sixth grade, and I actually went from sixth grade to twelfth grade at York Suburban, and it was the first time in my life that I'd lived in one place from, for that many years, and so I kind of considered this my home. And, so uh, you're a suburban boy. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, so after uh, I did everything, I went to school in, in Munich, and uh, and uh, after I was, I got tired of Europe, I came back here. And uh, I, I moved back here in uh, 1990, I believe. And it's been home ever since? Yep, I've been here ever since, yeah. And you didn't go back to sunny California? Before. I will, I will. <laughs> Once my kids are off to college and I retire, I'll so be heading back. So we get back, to yes. enjoy you while we can. Yes. Limited engagement. <laughs> it, it, it'll be a while yet, my, my uh, youngest. Um, got quite a, quite a few years ago yet, so. Okay, so when yeah. is the album coming out, guys? When? 2014? Yeah, 2014, <laughs> there you go. That's a good answer. That's a safe bet. So I we've been talking about wait. it for some time. Yeah, it's just it's hard finding, um, first of all, you know, recording a, a, an album on, on that type of a level on a professional grade. 
could be very expensive and, and very time consuming. And, um, you know, and <clears throat> not to mention the effort that, that needs to be put in. And, you know, with Ivan being a firefighter and um, with my job in the day, I mean, I have no, especially uh, during the summertime when all the swimming pools are opening up and everything, I have, there's hardly any time. It's just a matter of trying to coordinate something, you know, it's like you can just go in and record an album in one day, you know, it's something you got to keep going back and going over and going back and going over. And, like with writing the songs. And, um, cool. Yeah, yeah. That is like too a, cool. But we'll that get it done. Cool. We'll let you we know what we do. Done, yeah, yeah when, as soon as the album is out. You'll be on the list. All right. So, yeah, awesome. you're, you're getting the first copy. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we'll even autograph it for you. <laughs> totally a road trip groupie. And I have seen them live. I have seen them live. They are amazing live. Now. Make sure you check out Scott and Ivan at Kicking Cadillacs on February 15th up in York Haven. And make sure you find them on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Kodiak Band. Next up, we have the Poet Laureate of York Emeritus, mm -hmm. Carol Clark Williams, my predecessor, and someone who absolutely appreciates the power of editing and keeping that little black book, whether it's filled with songs or whether it's filled with incredible poetry. So ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy the reading of Carol Clark Williams. Um, I've been a poet for as long as I could write, and before that I would recite my own poetry to myself in a sing-song voice so that I could remember it. And I often say that poetry is my backbone because I feel like it's such an integral part of my life. It has sustained me through the bad times, it has made me some wonderful friends like Carla, mm and other poets in York with whom I feel connected. It brings you into groups of people who share the same interests. It has richly enhanced my life. Um, as a child, uh, we were sort of dragged up by each other, and uh, our parents were of that generation who did not plan families and were not exactly happy to find out they were having another arrival. And much of my poetry centers on that, that childhood and my relationships. So the first poem I brought today to read is one that I like the best about my family. It's the three of us, for me, my sisters Jeanette and Joan. In my mother's house, nightmare carried candles, tucked the quiet children into bed. Our blankets smoldered with her flickering anger. We crept through shadowy hallways, pitched headlong down narrow cavern stairs. In the lighted kitchen below, noisy dreams roistered at table. Past fistfuls of cards, played pinochle, made wagers, joked in indecipherable tongues, shrieking with brassy laughter. In ragged day, the corners of each room sharpen with guilt and obligation. Clothes hold closets hold darkness, clothes that do not fit. Rows of old scuffed shoes. One must go forth and do things that will make the mother proud. From our common bedroom, my sister's voices call, reedy as flutes, monotonous four-note soliloquy, my name repeated, sung in sorrow's cursive. Behind me, nightmare strikes her match. Another grim lamenting poem is one that I wrote uh, for a contest for Margie, an American journal. And it did win enough of a place to get me published in a glossy uh, anthology for the first time, which had been a dream of mine for three years. When I was notified about the publication, I was at the Philadelphia Zoo looking at the penguins, and my cell phone rang, and of course I can never find my cell phone, much less answer it. So by the time I was picking up Robert Nazarene's uh, message, I was staring at these penguins in their tuxedos and screaming, yes, yes, and the poem is called Signs of Age. I have always been an ochre rag knotted on a splintered stick, twisting in hard winds. I no longer believe that the runaway dog comes home, that squirrels can safely sprint across city streets. I am yellow crime scene tape across a sudden pit, pulled thin, one letter missing. Read me anger, do not cross this line. I am a weathered gray bone, tossed to the wind 
in city streets for a runaway dog to chase. Okay, now, as Monty Python would say, now for something completely different. My latest project is one that I'm having so much fun with <laughs> that I just can't wait to continue it. I keep looking for time and space to do that. I've started a little um, series of poems which are spoken by a rather snobbish, um, weather-beaten professor, college professor, in a dimension or age that probably isn't ours. Um, to my mind, he looks and sounds very much like Billy Collins mixed with Gene Hosey, the first poet laureate of, of Harrisburg. And so I have credited these lectures to Professor Hosen Collins, and it is called The Proper Study of Mankind, a series of, so far, four lectures. Um, this comes from Alexander Pope's poem, whose name I should know but do not, which says, To know thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. Session one. As you are all aware, mankind has always had the ability to levitate. It is a largely unrecognized human characteristic seen mainly in dreams and magic shows. We all know how to lift off the correct position of hands and arms, the impulse to rise, cold flow that pushes upward from the belly to the throat, we remember the flex of feet and knees springing, the relinquishment of control as legs straighten and the body, now horizontal, begins to skim, buoyed aloft by conviction and convection. Why more of us do not take part in this practice is a mystery, although we realize the air beneath us as we fly is never warm. Flying is an activity best practiced alone and in the cold. Are there any questions? At our next meeting, we will discuss the equally innate and unrecognized ability to walk through walls. And then I think I brought sec session two. How much time? Um, according to your syllabus, today we will discuss the various methods of walking through walls. As you are all aware, perhaps the most demanding aspect of this activity is the patience required to master fully those effective techniques which have long been practiced by Aborigines and other obscure interest groups. While we all have inherent an ability to follow procedure and accomplish the task, there is a strong impulse to rush through the process, which is, in fact, somewhat tedious and involves total concentration. It is not, by the way, so simple that even a child can do it, although there are always some exceptions to any rule. Nor should the potential wall walker entertain the outdated becoming one with the universe concept. The universe is much too big for that. Trying to do so simply erodes the walker's focus, which is absolutely essential to the successful completion of this activity. Detailed instructions for utilizing and perfecting the techniques can be found on page 67 of your text. Practice alone at first. Group wall walking is hazardous for beginners and can expose one to the consequence of becoming permanently melded with the wall, an outcome neither satisfying nor productive. In our next session, we will discuss in detail the inherent an unrecognized ability to dance. Excuse me? Question? What? Oh, no, not that kind of dance. And then we go directly to session four because the dance is going to be the most seditious and earth-shaking thing that people can do in a group or singly. And I have to work out a code to encrypt my poem, so that's going to take me a while. Did you want to hear session three, or are we running I short? want to hear session okay. three. Okay. This is actually session four, because session three would be the dance if it had been invented yet. It is somewhat surprising that many people postpone the practice of dematerialization until after death, since it is a useful application in many situations while one is still alive. One who employs this latent ability can avoid common unpleasantries 
For example, the bus bearing down as one crosses the street or the imminent approach of people one does not wish to encounter. The effect of dematerialization to facilitate eavesdropping is unparalleled. Combined with walking through walls and or levitation, one can attend unnoticed any gathering or conversation and be privy to all sorts of confidential information. Hence the drafting of Act 1367, an archaic law which forbids willful dematerialization because of its inherent potential to inflict harm on others while the body is in this discomposed state. Although the ruling is long outdated and sadly in need of modification, it is a valid attempt to temper the temptation of victimizing one's fellow man in confrontation or conflict. Nevertheless, who can deny the pleasure of scattering one's atoms across the soft grass on a summer evening to sparkle like tiny opals under the oval moon? Wow. And that's as far as I am. <laughs> okay. Tell me about this new project, because it sounds like you've been really letting this ruminate and thinking about this on an intellectual perspective, not just writing to get stuff out. Where did this idea come from? Um, as a child, I was a science fiction fanatic, and that continues through special effects oh. and sci-fi um, into my old age. I was terrified by Forbidden Planet. I saw um, yeah, practically every, even... Uh, what was it called, uh, Plan from, that awful old movie about the plan from Planet Nine with the shower curtain between the cockpit of the spaceship and the back of it with the creeping aliens. You know, I've seen the pod people, I've seen everything, and I've watched all the superhero television okay. shows. So it's something that is probably as much at the core of me as poetry is. And huh. I kept thinking that people want Superman to exist, they want the Flash, they want Iron Man, because there is something in all of us that responds to that and echoes that. And from there it's a simple step to, couldn't we really do it if we just knew that we could? So it's um, the idea of giving ourselves permission and having a special school like Professor Hosen Collins College to train, to levitate, to dance, to dematerialize carefully so that you could rematerialize, and that's probably from the fly. You know, I've borrowed <laughs> every idea that sci-fi ever presented, but... It's just inspiration. It's just inspiration. Yes. These fall out. These don't even need to be edited. They just come down and fall onto the paper. Whereas... So now, is that usually how it works for you when you get inspired and you just write and it comes out straight, or do you tend to sculpt a little bit more than that, generally. Signs of age, for example, woke up with the idea, because I have arthritis, the idea of being a, a worn, weathered bone. Mm. There was a poem I wrote about Noah and the ark, because I woke up at two one morning and thought, <laughs> <laughs> what did he do with all that manure? He was in a sealed ark. It was, <laughs> thankfully, cedar wood, which probably helped some, but he had right. elephants, he had horses, Right. He was in there for a month and 10 days. Where did he shovel? Because to go out would have been like being under Niagara Falls. The force of the rain was that intense. Mm, that's true. So they could not even go up on deck to take a breath of air. They were mm. just trapped with this. So out of that came another poem. But generally, I, I tossed them down. Was it Picasso who said that art is not getting work out? It's getting it down. So I toss okay. it down, and then I work on it until it suits me. And then sometimes I get it critiqued until it suits everybody. <laughs> so how long does it generally take you from when you just let it out until you feel that it's worth submitting for publication or worth putting into a collection? Some of them I'm satisfied with pretty much after the second editing, but some of them I put away. And that's good advice to any poet. If you have one that isn't quite working through for you, put it mm -hmm. in your drawer, shut the drawer, walk away from it. I pulled out a couple poems yesterday that were seven or eight years old and saw immediately wow. how I could have fixed them. And there's one that will never be fixed, but I just keep working on it and working on it. Is that how you do it? Is that your process? I actually go back and forth a lot. 
I'll sometimes have something that just comes out, just like you said, and then other times I'll have an idea or a line, and I'll put that, and I have a whole file of my individual lines that I just wait until the rest of the poem decides to build up around them. Yes, yeah. I have my notebook called Snippets for those, for those little scraps okay. of one and two lines. Of course, William Carlos Williams would have published it, the broken bottle's green, the grass is dark green. <laughs> he would have published it and made money on it. So now, if people want to find more of your work, where can they find your work at? Um, I am in some online publications. Uh, I was in Majira, which I think is still online, The Pedestal, um, Bent Needle. Um, I have several books that are out of print now, Stories of the Tribe and Music Lessons, which is a book that I made for my children. Um, oh. Chapbookpublisher.com had my last book, which is called Escaped Without Injury, which is most, okay. mostly my grumpy poems, very few cheerful ones in there. <laughs> and I'm looking to put together another one called Unpacking for the Journey, but I oh. want to just take my time because I don't know how many more books I have in me. I would like to really choose the, the poems I consider best to put in there. So do you feel like there is a certain amount of inspiration that each artist has, that some people might only have one great poem or one great book in them and that's it, it's done after that? No, I don't believe that. I know when I finished my first book, Stories of the Tribe, I thought, well, I'm finished, I'll never write another poem. <laughs> I really thought, you know, it was like the end of the world for me. I was just done. And then the next week, six more poems fell out. So it, it, that felt like quite a relief at the time. No, I think poetry is an art that demands getting into a certain zone. You have to, like, turn a corner, get into another dimension, have that quiet throbbing in your ears, kind of the echo going through your head. I don't know how to describe it. Right. Um, but... There are so precious few times that you can pull that zone around you and work. And when you can, I think you can always produce something worthwhile. It's a matter of, probably Professor Hosen Collins could tell you, creating, maybe that'll be the next one, <laughs> creating <laughs> um, what Max, Maxwell Smart used to call a cone of silence, creating a cone of silence yes. where you can get your work together and out and down. So no, I think everybody has more than one book in him, more than one song. They just need the time and space to do it. Nice. Now, not only is Carol Clark Williams one of the first people that instructed me when I came here, she does a tremendous amount of work teaching classes through York Arts and other city organizations and teaching students how to get their words out. And someone who knows a lot about helping students express themselves and get their art out into the world is our next guest, Cal Weary, who's actually the art director for New Hope Academy Charter School. It turns out Cal is also an incredible musician and spoken word artist. And only by begging was I able to get him to take our stage before he talks to us about some of the work he does with students at New Hope. So ladies and gentlemen, Cal Weary. This song is called In My Country. Take away the song you sing Take away your cold moonlight The fish were jumping and the moon was quite a sight Take away your pain today I Take it all and come what may in my country there is nothing left to eat in my country we're still living on the streets in my country 
We're still fighting for the war in my country. We're still fighting cause we're poor. My country, tears of the sweet land of liberty, of the I see. Take away most everything I take it all and come with me I take away your cold moonlight The fish were jumping and the moon was quite a sight I take away your pain today Take it all and come what may Cause in my country There is nothing left to eat In my country We're all living on the street In my country We're all fighting for the day In my country We're all fighting for our pain my country, tears of the sweet land of liberty, of the I see. Oh, Lord, no, now, well, I see it all, 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 I see it all. And it's all.
<laughs> We're back with rock star and oh, oh. administrative guru, Cal Weary, who's mm. currently arts director for New Hope Academy Charter School. Okay, so how do we balance rock god <laughs> with oh. nurturing the impressionable young minds of York City? That is that is very funny that you said that. <laughs> um, I, honestly, my, my rock and roll years um, were were too few and and pretty much over. But I, every now and then I get an opportunity to to sing a little bit. So I like going to open mic nights. And that usually pacifies okay. me so that I can go to work each day. And uh, <laughs> you need to just get it out. I, I exercise I am, I am the rock demon. The next, I am breeding the next generation of rock and roll legends, uh, or okay. or accountants. Okay, so tell first. me what exactly is it that you do at New Hope with the kids? Uh, well, I am the director of the arts program there. We call our arts program the New Hope School of the Arts. Uh, we're housed at the Strand Capital Performing Arts Center, which is an awesome okay. relationship that we have with them. Um, my main job is to keep things going. I make relationships, okay. connections like this one, um, mm -hmm. for better opportunities for our students in the arts. Uh, the main point is that these guys, whether they become artists uh, or continue with their art or become doctors and lawyers, that they have a love for the arts the rest of their lives. And that's, okay. that's, that's the way my life is. I mean, I've slowly slid from you know, wearing uh, tattered t-shirts and jeans and touring up and down the coast to being a guy who sits at a computer a lot and goes to a lot of meetings. Mm -hmm. And as fun as that, that can be, if I don't do that, then there's hundreds, thousands of kids who aren't gonna get what they need as far as their arts education is concerned. And in a bigger sense, their education as a whole, as society's, society's next, you know, uh, leaders, so. Okay, now I know this should be a brainless question, but the arts are still the first things that are being cut from virtually every academic program. So how is it that you can justify doing this hugely art-influenced curriculum in a school system that's already so academically challenged where there's more and more pressure, get the test scores up, get the academics up? I tell you, it's, it's an interesting question that you ask too, and, and here's, here's the, here's the non-cliche answer. <laughs> the arts when lost, okay. lead to lower test scores. Any Bam. testing that you, any, any data that you look at will show you that the highest pro producing students in any school are your music students, your performing arts students, the yeah. kids that are, I use a term called triple vested. And what I mean by triple vested, it means that you have parents who are involved in the student's life, a core subject teacher who's very involved with the student, and an extracurricular subject that they're, that they're a part of. So what that means is what this looks like a you know a snapshot of this kid is a kid who you know um, has parents whether it's a single parent or you know you have some weird mixture of like grandparents or that there's a parent at home a guardian that's involved. What did you get on your test? How are things going? You're sitting down to dinner together. Mm -hmm. that, that's part of it. The next step is you have a core level teacher, maybe your math teacher, your science teacher, who, who you've connected with, who you've made a connection to. That right. teacher is involved in your life, knows what you're doing with these other things, that you play basketball and do other things. Then you have basketball, or you have the school play, and there's another teacher there, or another person who's working for the school district, or whomever, that's a part of your life there, and asks you about your grades, or asks you how things are going at home, or your job. Those triple vested students, they, they can't get away from the, literally, the, the support staff. That's a support staff for their life and it, it helps them move them through. And I honestly believe that that is why we have successful students. The students that we have start in fifth grade. We follow them from fifth grade through 12th. Track to them. college. And we college, follow, we the magic them to word. College. Then when they're in college, yeah. they still can call us. And they call us and they do call us. And, so there's um, a relationship a that really relationship develops there. on a personal level beyond right. just the academic one. Yes, and so that's why I say that you know, for us, we have a school that has, has dedicated itself to the arts cause. They recognize that that's the mistake that everyone else has made. Our okay. school is literally established on taking a look at what the problems are and the mistakes that are being made other places and not duplicating them. You know, right. um, looking at what, what best practices work and trying to implement them. And when they don't work, guess what we do? We get rid of it. So the arts mm. have worked. We started off with 20 kids in our program, ended last year with 68 and came in nice. this year with 230. 
230. That was my three-year projection. So we're doing something right. Okay. And most of those students are students from the city. Uh, we do have some students who come from outside, but we're trying to increase those amounts also. Not to steal students from anyone, but literally to enhance their arts relationship with our city. All great things start in the city and trickle out. Indeed. That's the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That's good for us. That's good for our county, too. Now, you, you know, know the whole charter school idea is still a little controversial. Right. You know, people saying, well, they're just making things up as they go along. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Well, for me, I've been doing this for 16 years. So, um, okay. and I do believe in making things up as you go along for improv. But there are certain things that just make sense. There are certain, the, the Renaissance man and woman idea is not something being made up as it goes along. It's nice. been here since the beginning of education itself. And that we, we completely bombard our students. If there's a single person out there who's listening to me talk right now who had any kind of arts in their life, who aren't going, wow, I wish I had that when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Every artist who will watch this program will go, man, I wish I would have had someone who was bringing me artists to work with, who uh, on a daily basis I was able to, to actually enhance and work with um, computers that I could do my drafting with, uh, uh, build real sets and get my hands dirty with, and uh, learn how to tap, do modern hip hop, ballet, every day in a space that was made for me. I, I as an artist, was in a specialized program, and still, this is the genesis of that. It's, it's a greater thing. So um, whenever I hear someone make the comment you know, why is it, should there be money for this? It's like, this, it's more than just a catalyst that brings students in, it's a way of life, literally. Nice, so you're still living the way of life of the, the rock star who toured up and down um, the coast, you're just spinning it a little differently now. Well, you know, the, the, the spontaneity of every day, I have the best job in the world for me, you know? Okay. And it's more than just about, you know, uh, uh, just getting out there and, and, and teaching them to be artists. I mean, most of our kids, the majority of them are not going to have artist lives. I did it for a long time. And I wish that I could flash for like, like put the, you know, the mask or the, or the helmet on them and let them flash through all my experiences and then they can make <laughs> right. a decision right there. And that could, you know, but it's not gonna it work that way. So all I can do is I can train them to be the best that they possibly can be. And also let them know that it's important for them to learn all the other stuff too. Not just important, it's imperative. You need to know how to handle your money if you're gonna make any. You mm -hmm. need to know you know, about your history if you're gonna write things that make sense as an artist, uh, as, a, as a writer, as a poet. You need to know about that which came before you. I mean, even down to anatomy for dancers. You need to know how your body works so that you can move properly. So to me, the arts are the culmination of everything else that you learned in every other class realized an actual application. And okay. that's why to me, I feel I do feel like a rock star every day. My kids make me feel that way. But just it's just a different it's a different take. Before I used to jump off stages and 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 headbutt people and now, you know, sometimes I say <laughs> things that feel like I jumped off a stage at you and headbutted you. But I'm I'm very intense and I in my belief that what we can do with the arts for this city, for this county, for you know, for Pennsylvania, I, I, I just I just feel that it's it's a ripple effect that just goes out across our country and across our society. Okay, so besides the mechanics of singing, right. what influenced you the most that you learned coming up? Like what, what made you the um, better singer and the artist and performer that you were? You know, trial and error. I, I, I gotta <laughs> admit, I was allowed to experiment <laughs> with that. Um, you know, from age four I was performing. And wow. um, you know, it, I was, it, was, it was cultivated in, in taking a, Acting classes at York Little Theater, um, you know, performing, um, you know, everywhere up Japan, Kuala Lumpur, Penang, Bangkok, Singapore, even before I was age wow. 15 with the Pennsylvania Ambassadors of Music. Uh, I went to your country day school and they cultivated, um, wow. they saw something in you, you know, small, they saw something, even the smallest like inkling of, oh, he might be able to do this. And they went forward with it. I still love that school for that. And it's one of the things that I'm implementing with our students. We have small uh, learning communities where we really attack. We attack that, that, that think that little voice inside of you that says you can't do it. We attack that voice hardcore. Our shows show it. Our, our performances we perform, the kids perform at least 15 uh, performances a year. Wow. You know, where most schools, you, you might get two big shows. Right. Um, 
And my my viewpoint is is that for all the sh school, schools that are out there, I don't we don't have rivalries with them. We don't we don't have rivals with them as far as um, sports are concerned. We're not even in the same divisions. And when it comes to this, I would love for those kids to come to us and learn what we have to teach them and send them back to their schools for their plays, for their musicals, uh, for their mock trial groups, for their mm -hmm. you know all that, so that they have that 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 poise, that posture, that production value. That's that's my that's my life's work at this point. That's the legacy that I hope to be able to, to spill out all over your county. Awesome, thank you. Your next task is to watch this video clip of the week, which is actually going to be within me, a original rap piece by Moot Black featuring Conscious, Fiend, Mechno, Vision, CoStar, completely homegrown York hip hop. So you want to talk about students? getting themselves out there and making incredible tributes to their city. Check out this video and see how many York places you can find. Tell me where it's really at. Body more, murder land. Tell me where it's trilla at. But tell me I ain't make it out. Look now how I'm making out. All of my niggas was moving work. Funny I ain't take that route. I had a dream I put in that work just to make my mama proud. And you would too if you knew what this game would do to you. It's two ways out. Choose it now or just sell over funeral. I chose to choose my dreams. Think out the box just like a Cuba. Uh, yeah, no see no evo. Yeah, channel my thoughts like Vivo. Uh, Everybody wanna be a Carlito, Devo, Nino type hero. With a heart just below zero. Just sensitized by violence, mama's crying, cousins dying, people march and stop the wild, and I be repping for my city, yo. Need to take our school back, less politics, more teaching the kids the truth back. My side was your side, but we all from the same place. East, West, South, P way ain't safe, you what we gon' do, huh? Something to me and you, huh? To all of the problems we see. Dumb, they said I was stupid when I was weak. They held me down. I put my strength in this music. My people go through it, but I know this can't be life. My city gon' shine. Got candles if they shut off our light. I had the right to remain silent, but I look out my window and see sirens. We losing our youth to violence. A product in my environment made it it educated. They hate it. I ain't giving up. My city gon' make it. You know, I stand tall. Community activist. Daily fighting for the children coming after this And so I put them up like a black fist Different agenda so I end up on the black list I'm moving uh, Every day we losing more rights Losing more youngins to the system equals more kites oh, yeah. We gotta wake up, not wake and bake nah. Ayo, it's time to spread love, I can't you take can the hate You can anthem But the point right here is to stand up To all of the problems we see What are we really fighting for? What is my purpose? What am I writing for? It's killing me that we ain't taking responsibility. You know what's real to me? Is we lead by example and have accountability. The society has us set up to fail. Where my strong sisters at? With my positive black male, it's time to be active and start giving back. Co-star, let's put York City on the map. Conscious. You can call it an anthem.